Thank you for joining today. The webinar will begin in about one minute. We invite you to take a look at the closed captioning and technical support. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar today, Tapping into Small Business and Biotech Funding to Accelerate Alzheimer's Research Innovations. Throughout the webinar, you can submit questions and comments. To share questions, please look in the chat window on the right side of your screen. Questions will be reviewed during the Q&A period. We also have closed captioning available and technical support. If you have any questions on technical support, please call 888-799-9666. Please know that we will have a Q&A session and that you can chat us throughout the webinar. This is an interactive opportunity. I want to acknowledge our host today, the National Institute on Aging, as well as ADDF, they are coming together to try to accelerate innovation. Our featured speakers are Todd Heim. He's a director of the Office of Small Business Research at the National Institute on Aging at NIH. We also have Zane Martin. She's going to be answering your questions throughout the Q&A session of this webinar today. From ADDF, we have Alessio Travaglia. He's going to be talking about some new programs and ways for you to find out about funding. And I will be hosting the Q&A session of today's session. You'll be hearing from the National Institute on Aging, Office of Small Business Research, followed by ADDF, and then there will be a moderated Q&A. This is just a reminder, please do send us questions throughout the webinar. You can look at the right-hand side of your screen and hit the chat. We'll also collect feedback from you at the end of the webinar, so look out for a brief opportunity to answer some questions. With that said, I'd like to begin and turn it over to Dr. Todd Heim. Thank you very much, Monique. Uh, so I'll be talking about the NIA, Office of Small Business Research, and the types of programs that we have available. Next slide. So the, for those that don't know, the SBIR and STTR program are congressionally mandated programs that serve as a vehicle for agencies that provide extramural funding, usually thought of as funding to academic centers and institutions, um, that a portion of that, those funds would actually go to small businesses. And there's two sister programs, and I'll go over the differences of both. Together, it's 3.65% of the extramural funds at each agency goes to small business businesses through these programs. So each agency uses it as a way that best meets their mission. So a DOD, for an example, they would use it to fund the development of warfighter technologies that they could acquire. At the NIH, we don't use it to fund development of technologies that we would acquire, but rather to fund the development of technologies that help meet our mission of improving uh, health. Thus, at the NIA, we fund the development um, and further development of technologies and research that maybe NIH previously funded through other grant mechanisms, but now to try to fund the development steps that are needed to advance the project further towards commercialization. Next slide. There are a lot of advantages to small business funding through SBIR and STTR. They, First and foremost is it is non-dilutive, which means 
We do not take any equity. There are no royalties. It is not a loan, so there, are no, there is no repayment. Um, importantly, the small business does retain all intellectual property rights. Uh, it has been shown to provide recognition, verification, and visibility. A lot of outside investors like to see the validation that comes from the NIH peer review, and thus the combination of that valid validation and the data that can be collected in a non-diluter fashion both help to attract the additional private funding that will almost certainly be needed, needed to commercialize your technologies. Next slide. In order to be eligible for the program, you have to meet the U.S. Small Business Administration's definition of a small business, which is essentially that you are a um, U.S. small business. You're owned and operated by individuals, uh, citizens, or permanent residents of the U.S. And um, you can be owned and operated by venture firms now as, as long as uh, no one venture capital operating company owns a majority of your company, of your small business. But if it's a, um, if multiple venture capital operating companies together as a syndicate um, own the majority of your business, then that would be now okay. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there are a few differences between SBIR and STTR. Important to note is that the award is always made to the small business, um, not to the academic research institution. In both SBR and STTR, we do find that the, um, there is usually a partnership with an academic institution, although it is not required. Um, however, with STTR, it is required. Um, there are different percentages in terms of how much of the cost can go to subcontracts versus the small business. So for SBIR, two-thirds of the work in phase one must be done by the small business, meaning two-thirds of the cost should be at the small business. Only one-third can be subcontracted to an, to an academic institution. Um, there are allowances for fee-for-service, which I can talk about. For STTR, you can have a, oh, there's a minimum of 40% at the small business, a minimum of 30% at the U.S. research institution, and then the remaining 30% can be either of those two or a third partner. The other key difference is that for STTR, the PI can be at the university. Um, for SBIR, there has to be a PI that's at the small business, but you could have a multi-PI for SBIR where one of the PIs is at the small business and one of them is at the academic institution. Generally, we see STTR as the model for companies that are really brand new spin out to the university and that much of the work and leadership will still be done by the university personnel. Next slide. So you'll hear um, many different budget numbers thrown out around SBIR, and it, it can be pretty confusing. There are congressional guidelines that are government-wide, and in the legislation, they, it states that the NIH um, is entitled to go 50% above those guidelines to so what they call hard caps. However, the NIH has successfully received waivers to go even above those hard caps for a set of topics that is really quite broad and expansive. So I think for many of the people, if not almost all the people on the line, you will be eligible to go above those caps. And in the solicitation, there is a link to the set of waiver topics. Um, if you can go above the cap, what we do in each solicitation is we state what the budget limit above the cap is for that solicitation. So for phase one, for most of our solicitations, it's up to $300,000. We do have a very open-ended Alzheimer's disease solicitation, PS19-316. So anything that goes through that solicitation can be up to $450,000. For phase two, generally, it's usually $2 million at NIA, but for that Alzheimer's disease solicitation, it can be up to $2.5 million. Remember that Congress um, uses the phase nomenclature for SBIR, but it has no correlation with the clinical trial nomenclature, so phase one SBIR is often preclinical, but does not have to be. 
There is also the ability to apply for Phase 1 and Phase 2 at the same time as part of one combined application, and that's called the Fast Track. The advantage there is that once you complete the Phase 1 portion, you will have to have set milestones in the application, and when you complete that Phase 1 portion, you would send us a document demonstrating that you have met all the milestones. And if we agree that the milestones have been met, then you would transition to phase two without having to reapply and wait for review of that phase two portion. For companies that already have proof of concept data, so as an example for a therapeutic, if you have in vivo data in an animal, in a relevant animal model, um, then you can come in directly for phase two now. And you just must show in your application what that proof of concept phase one equivalent data is. And then you can come in straight for these phase two levels of two, 2.5 million in Alzheimer's disease. We are happy to announce that we now also allow the, we accept the commercialization readiness pilot applications. And these are actually an additional $3.3 .3 million and you can apply either during your phase two or after your phase two. And it can pay for late stage R&D, such as IND enabling studies, manufacturing, scale up, as well as technical assistance. And then after that, you can also apply for the phase two, or in parallel, you can also apply for the phase two B, which is, can be an additional $3 million. Next slide. So, I manage the Office of Small Business Research at the National Institute in Aging, and in our office we have six key function areas. The first is to coordinate the program across the institute. We provide guidance to applicants, which I'll talk about. We are very happy to guide you before you apply. Um, we do outreach, such as this webinar, and you'll see that we are always out on the road and happy to meet with potential applicants at conferences or regional workshops. Uh, funding, obviously, first and foremost. Networking, trying to facilitate connections between you, maybe NIA programs or external resources. And then entrepreneurship, several entrepreneurship training programs are now available for all grantees. Next slide. So at the NIA, our mission area is actually quite broad. We look to fund technologies that will help um, enable and extend healthy aging um, that really can cover a wide variety of areas. In terms of SBR and STTR, we're looking for things that will solve an unmet clinical need and have some significant commercial potential. We do have uh, priority areas around Alzheimer's disease due to increased congressional funding in um, that specific area but very open in terms of what types of things for Alzheimer's disease we would be interested in, whether they would be prevention, therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, digital health, caregiver coordination, everything um, really that can help in the AD space. Uh, many of our applications come through the omnibus solicitation, which is investigator initiated, um, but then we also have that Alzheimer's funding opportunity, PAS-19-316 that is specific to anything relating to Alzheimer's. Next slide. At the NIA, we have four main divisions, the Division of Aging Biology, the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, the Division of Geriatrics and Clinical Gerontology, and the Division of Neuroscience. So many on the phone are interested in Alzheimer's disease, drugs, and um, Diagnostics, those would fall under the Division of Neuroscience. And my colleague, Dr. Zane Martin, will be here for the Q&A, and she represents the Division of Neuroscience as their small business lead. Next slide. So here's a list of all the funding opportunities that we have. Um, you see the Omnibus, and you also see that PAS-19-316 and 317, SBI and STTR, respectively. Um, those are the main ones that you would likely apply to. Next slide. I mentioned the CRP for those that already have a phase two. It's really useful for uh, companies that need to do work that might not be considered traditional R&D and maybe not innovative in, in and of itself, but critical 
to advance towards commercialization. And those are things that we could pay for with the CRP award. You can apply either during your phase two or after your phase two. Next slide. So the SBIR program um, is similar in many ways to the other research funding mechanisms at the NIH, but the one major difference is the focus on the product instead of the science, but the science is, of course, underpinning that product and that focus. So as an example, it, it will have many of the same review criteria, but significance for an R1 will be in terms of how much knowledge are you adding to the field? What's the likelihood of a landmark publication? <laughs> but for SBIR, significance will be defined as, you know, what is a value proposition? How strong is that competitive advantage? What's the unmet need? So you're still looking at significance in both cases, but really looking at it through a very different lens. Next slide. I mentioned how we are happy to provide guidance to applicants um, before they apply. You know, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of key benefits to the program. In my mind, there's really only one cost of applying for the program, and that's time. Because it, it is a federal program, there are, you know, robust applications that you have to go through and complete. Um, but we are here to kind of demystify that process for you and answer any questions you may have. We suggest that you uh, first develop the specific aims page, which is a key score driving page of the application, and send that to us at least four weeks ahead of the application due date. If you do that, it enables us to really provide much more concrete guidance, because many of your questions will be, well, what's the chance that this will be competitive? Is this the right? types of experiments to do in a phase one or phase two. Should I do a phase one? Should I do a fast track? You know, what's allowed in terms of budget? So all of those questions can be answered once we have that specific games page. A truly competitive specific games page is so much more than the aims. Really, the specific games page should be the executive summary of the application and should answer the question to the NIH that if we get a thousand applications, which we get over a thousand applications, why would this application be the one that we should prioritize the most with funding? And you should be able to do that in that first half to two thirds of the page, the elevator pitch. Um, that can include um, textual highlights of the preliminary data that you would show in the rest of the application, the value proposition and the relevance. In that last third to half a page will be the aims and milestones that will be part of the project you are requesting funding for. You can send that directly to our office um, four weeks before the due date or more, and we can schedule a call to provide guidance. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so we we understand that probably the most important thing we can do is provide you the funding you need to collect the data that is required to attract external investors, including um, the ADDF, which is a, a, a great potential resource for you and you'll hear more about. Um, we, but we also have several other non-financial resources to help you. There is the applicant, applicant Assistance Program, which actually had a due date today, but we run it every few months, so there'll be another due date three, four months from now. Um, it's a 10-week coaching program to help develop your application, um, and that's specifically for uh, applicants that have never received SBR funding before. We also, once you receive your money, your grant, we have several um, assistance programs. In your application, you can actually request for technical assistance funding, $6,500 in phase one and $50,000 in phase two, to provide funds for things like a regulatory consistent uh, consultant or reimbursement consultant or IP, anything of that sort. Um, once you have your grant, you can apply for several programs, including uh, i which is an entrepreneurial training program for phase one. The C3AI, which is a more um, long-term and expansive entrepreneur, entrepreneurial training program specifically for device companies. Uh, diversity supplements to expand diversity on your team. And several resources through the new NIH 
Small Business Entrepreneurial Education and Development Office, including entrepreneurs and residents that are past investors um, that can advise you on, you know, discussions with external investors and things of that sort, and regulatory support as well. Next slide. So please feel free to connect with us in the future. The, the one thing I didn't say, which I did want to add in, because in, it's a question we always get, is in terms of the budget. So as I said, two-thirds of the budget has to be going to the company, uh, but that can include fee-for-service activities. So if you're sending something out to a commercially available resource, let's say a COO, and they have a screen that they do, they sell it commercially, you send them the drug, your drug, they run it through the screen, they send you back the data, you do all the analysis. They're billing on a fee per basis, meaning they're not charging any indirect rates. That can count as part of the small business's cost and within the two-thirds, because um, you're essentially buying that service as a, as a supply, and it can be part of your materials and supplies budget. It can't make up all the costs. You still need to be doing some of the work yourselves. But things like academic um, partnerships, where there will be intellectual input from the academic partner, and they will likely charge indirect rates, those are subcontracts, and those have to be within the one-third of the budget for a phase one SBIR, as an example. The last thing I want to say is that um, please feel free to email us, but if you'd like to meet, we, are, we have an upcoming event section on our website, and we do you know, attend conferences around the country. We will actually be in San Francisco for JP Morgan Week, and we have space um, and staff available, including Dr. Zane Martin, to meet with potential applicants. So if you will be in San Francisco, during J.P. Morgan Healthcare Week, I think the week of January 12th. Um, please email Lainey, who you'll have her email address at the end of this presentation, um, at the end of the webinar, and Lainey can schedule a time for you to sit down and meet with us uh, that week in San Francisco. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from ADDF. Thank you, Alessio, for being a great partner and doing this together. Thank you, Todd. So today I will discuss our funding opportunities and also what we're looking for in a successful application. Next. Over the past 20 years, the Alzheimer's Trade Discovery Foundation, ADF, has invested over $130 million and we did funded over 600 programs in 19 countries. For now, we have over 130 active programs, and this includes 32 active clinical trials. Next. So we do follow a venture philanthropy model. This means that we make investments, and uh, this typically with the academic is done with royalties, whereas the investment type for um, companies is royalty or equity or convertible notes with warrants. Now, we do way more than funding, because in addition to providing financial support, we can also help to spin out companies, we can introduce to other investors, we can provide validation and also foster collaboration. And something that we do quite often is also helping design studies and providing resources within our network. So you can see in the next slide, we are target agnostic, and we do have a pretty diverse uh, drug target portfolio. We do support projects uh, in neuroinflammation, neuroprotection, neurotransmission, epigenetic, vascular, and uh, next to the next slide. And to differentiate ourselves in addition to our pretty diverse uh, drug target portfolio, we also differentiate our portfolio in terms of key areas of focus. We do support the drug development through preclinical studies. We do support development and validation of plasma, CSF, neuroimaging, and digital biomarkers. We do support uh, regulatory studies. And we do support, and we are very interested in uh, clinical trials and uh, epidemiological studies. So next, let's look at our core funding opportunities. 
So the first good news is that, uh, as you can see, pretty much everyone is uh, eligible to apply because we do support academics, we do support biotech, and there is no geographic restriction. We do have uh, four cycles over the year, and we do have four core RFPs that are listed here, and there are also links, uh, and at the end you're gonna have these slides, so you're gonna easily have information, detailed information about these RFPs. So what I'm going to do next is to discuss briefly each RFP and also what they're looking for in successful applications. Next. So the first RFP I'm going to discuss is the drug development RFP. This does support preclinical PKPD target engagement and also in vivo efficacy or proof of concept studies. We do support the novel repurposed and reposition drugs and we're interested in small molecules and also biologics. Something that is very important to highlight here is that we are interested in late preclinical studies that most likely will reach in the enabling studies within two years. This means, uh, if we go to the next bullet point, that we have very limited interest. We do not support basic science target identification, target validation, and screenings. Something else that I need to mention here is that though we are target agnostic, in this RFP we do not support uh, anti-amyloid anti -amyloid approaches and cholinesterase inhibitors. So why projects in the drug development RFP are rejected? Typically it's because of the stage of discovery. So again, we're not interested in basic science programs. Also, for programs that uh, aim to test uh, repurpose or reposition drugs, it has to be really clear why it's important to do additional preclinical studies instead of just going to clinical trial. Next. Next RFP is the program to accel accelerate clinical trial. This RFP supports early stage clinical trials, including phase zero, phase one, and phase two clinical trials and also regulatory studies, including non-GLP and GLP pharmacology, IND enabling studies, long-term talks, GMP manufacturing testing. As mentioned before for the drug development RFP, we do support novel repurpose and reposition drugs, and we're interested in small molecules and biologics. And as you can see in the next uh, bullet point, again, Though we are target agnostic, in this RFP we do not support anti-amyloid approaches and cholinesterase inhibitors. So what's the main reason why proposals are rejected in this RFP? It's typically the lack of biological rationale. So if you submit an application, please be clear why you're proposing this drug, what's the mechanism of action, and also why this drug should work in Alzheimer's disease. Also, typically, the strongest application have a very solid data package and also are pretty clear in why the dose has to be chosen and also what is or are the biomarkers to measure target engagement. Next. Next RFP is the neuroimaging and CSF biomarker development. This RFP focuses on developing or novel PET ligands supporting novel CSF biomarkers, and validating established MRI, MRI approaches in larger cohorts. Something that I'm gonna mention in the next slide is that we do support to an additional RFP peripheral biofluids and digital biomarkers that so are not uh, fundable in this RFP. The main reason why proposals are declined in this um, RFP it's typically lack of preliminary data. And again, remember that we do support the exploratory and basic science project. And the strongest proposals are the ones that not only have uh, good preliminary data, but also have a very clear context of use, and also clarify how the biomarker compares to other available biomarkers. And last thing I wanna mention here, as you see in the bullet point, that in this RFP, we have very limited interest in CSF measures of amyloid and tau. And again, this is because it has to be clear how the biomarker 
compared with what's already available. In this case, uh, amyloid and tau. Next. The prevention beyond the pipeline RFP supports the clinical trial for Alzheimer's, but also has conditions that have been linked to increased risk of dementia, include, including cognitive aging, uh, postoperative delirium, uh, traumatic brain injury. And specifically, this RFP supports prevention clinical trials, comparative effectiveness research, and also epidemiological studies. Next. As Todd briefly mentioned, I'm very excited to announce this new opportunity. This is to provide bridge funding to support companies that have been already awarded with the SBR funding. And the goal of this funding is to generate bridge funding to give you the opportunity to generate new preliminary data before applying to larger NIH funding. And uh, I do encourage you all, if you already had uh, SBR, grant or as soon as you get the SBR grant to get in contact with us so that you can know you, your program, and see whether you are a good fit for our funding opportunities. Something else that we do consider are programs that have been scored but not funded by NIA and NINDS <coughs> grants. And for this case, we have a facilitated the way to review your proposal. You will just need to submit to us your review sent to the NIH in NIH format and the comments from the reviewers. And something that I want to clarify here is that, again, all the proposals need to fit within our current funding opportunities and priorities. Next. We do have several other RFPs over the years, and uh, those includes the partnership with the Eddington Discovery Institute, and the partnership with the FTD to discover new drug and run clinical trial for frontotemporal dementia. So I would just invite you to check our website frequently for updates on special RFP or sign up to our newsletter to be updated on these uh, RFPs. And next. Last year, we did announce a novel RFP that is the Diagnostic Accelerator. This is a nearly 50 million funds from partners including Bill Gates, Leonard Lauder, Dolby Family, Schwab Foundation, and Jeff Bezos. And the goal here is to develop novel biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Next. Why we need to develop uh, novel biomarkers? We do believe that having affordable and reliable biomarkers really change the way we do Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, research, because this is going to give, you the, give us the opportunity to track disease progression, identify people, um, I'm still focus on the previous slide, uh, that have uh, identified people for more efficient clinical trial and allow to monitor response to treatment. Right now we are accepting application on a rolling basis for peripheral biomarker and here, specifically, we're interested in biomarkers in blood, saliva, urine, ocular biomarkers, and other. And also, uh, we do accept application for digital biomarkers, focusing on symptoms domain, including cognition, speech, motor, sleep, and other. And this can be done using digital platforms such as portable sensors or softwares. So again, check our website. We're accepting application on a rolling basis. Next. And last, I want to encourage you all to find the right RFP that fits your program. As mentioned before, the main reasons why programs are rejected typically is uh, that do not fit within our priorities. And so please look carefully also our evaluation criteria that are specific for each RFP. And this is really going to make your proposal stronger if you follow the guidelines that we stated. The last thing that I want to mention is that uh, uh, to reach out to us, not only if you have questions, but also if you have any interesting idea that you would like to discuss to us and develop. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do more than funding, and we do have also an iterative review process. So we can help you to find resources for your study um, if, if, or run a clinical trial if we are interested in your approach. Our review process uh, 
start uh, with a letter of intent and next deadline is going to be January 17. And then invited full proposal are sent out for external review. And uh, overall, we try to make our funding decision in about five months. And uh, in the next slide, you are going to find uh, my content information. And with this, I want to thank you all for your attention and uh, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Travaglio. We will now be transitioning to the Q&A portion of our session here today. To submit a question for either speaker, that will be Dr. Zane Martin, as well as Dr. Alicia Travaglio. You can please look at the chat feature or the Q&A feature at the bottom of your um, screen. We have received a few questions already, and so we'll be moving first with some of those. We did get some basic uh, housekeeping questions. Um, one, we've been asked if the slides will be shared, and we wanted to let you know that we will be posting these slides to the NIA website, and we'll be sending an email out about um, that, as well as the resources that have been shared from ADDF, as well as the NIA Office of Small Business Research. With that said, I'm going to turn the first question to Dr. Martin. There was a question about the commercialization readiness program and what are the milestones one needs to accomplish and apply for this? Right, yes, uh, the, that's a good question. This is Zane Martin. So the, commercializ the commercialization readiness pilot program is um, for technical assistance in later stage R&D. Um, one of the requirements for to apply for the CRP is uh, that you must be in or have completed um, a phase two or phase two B um, grant. Um, uh, in in four uh, further milestone or to to feel that you are prepared to apply for a CRP, I recommend contacting your program officer uh, to talk about what um, milestones and goals that you have met in your phase two and uh, to see the appropriateness um, and readiness for the CRP program. Thank you. And I think the next question uh, applies to both ADDF as well as NIA. How strong is the requirement for preliminary data to be provided in the proposal for application? I'll start off maybe uh, if you can go first, Dr. Travaglio. Sure. It really depends from the specific RFP. But I would say that the preliminary data have to convince us and our reviewer that uh, the program has a high success to, to work. So we don't want something that is based on possibility or review literature. We want uh, um, for example, if the drug uh, um, needs to be tested in a clinical trial, has this been tested in animal model? Do we have information about the safety of the drug, how the dose has been selected? So it really depends on the specific kind of thing. And so I would encourage the person to ask this question to elaborate more so you provide more detail. Um, but uh, again, like the goal is to convince uh, us and the reviewer that the program has high success. To, to work. Thank you. And Dr. Martin, did you want to add anything there for NIA specific data sure. to be provided? Okay. Um, so for for phase one applications, um, preliminary data is not required. Um, however, it, it is very helpful to demonstrate the likelihood of success for a phase one um, feasibility study. Phase two, um, there should be there should be preliminary data for phase two. Uh, preliminary data can include um, published studies from others in the field that lay the groundwork for the proposed study. Um, and of course, also um, studies that are done in the lab by that PI. But importantly, the reviewers um, for the publications, uh, reviewers rarely read the reference papers. Uh, so make sure that all the key preliminary data is shown in the body of the research strategy. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And there is a follow-up question about preliminary data. The question is, uh, 
what would be better to include repurposable drug data for patient population, validation data such as insurance claims and EHRs, or the 80 genetic mice model data? Um, okay, I, so I guess I'll answer that first. Um, so from what I'm getting from that question is what is more translatable, which uh, data would be more translatable because especially in the Alzheimer's field, um, preclinical animal studies uh, is um, around 99% don't translate into human clinical trials. So that has been a, a problem uh, when looking at how best to translate um, drugs into, into the clinic. Um, with that in mind, um, it is good to also have some sort of human studies as well. That could be post-mortem tissue um, experiments um, for repur repurposable drugs um, as the, uh, the, question, uh, the, the question was asked, um, could be valid as well, depending on the purpose of the study. Um, but I think the bottom line is, is um, that the studies ne need to be as robust and rigorous as possible. Uh, uh, Alicia, do you have anything else to add on that? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. I could make a specific example of a program that we did fund. Uh, um, the program was to repurpose reticotin, that is a dopamine agonist using Parkinson and to use this transdermal patch of reticotin in Alzheimer's patient. And so in this case, the evidence not only were coming from the Parkinson field that the drug was safe, but uh, there was uh, an introduction discussing why do we have to target uh, dopamine in Alzheimer's patient. So what's the expression level of uh, relevant receptors and downstream mechanism in the Alzheimer's brain? Is this something that is downregulated? convincing the fact that if we rescue this mechanism, it's going to bring a benefit. And the other thing that we do when I see in a case like this is also how are we going to measure this? We, in clinical trial application, we do not want to see uh, cognition as a primary outcome. We ideally would like to see a biomarker that is going to give confidence that uh, the drug is working the way it's supposed to work. And also is going to give confidence to other investors to further support your program. Okay. Well, I'll give our speakers a brief minute to catch up. I wanted to share some quick uh, reminders. Um, you can submit questions through the chat and Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, in the chat, we have actually included some links to the ADDF as well as the NIA um, small business website so you can look at some of the contacts we mentioned and the open funding opportunities that are available right now. With that said, I'll turn to our next question. Is there a specific program for women-owned companies or for PIs for, from underrepresented groups? So essentially, is there any advantage to support these uh, underrepresented groups through either ADDF or the uh, NIA SBR program? I'm gonna start off with Zane on this question. Okay. Sure. Um, so we, uh, NIA has just joined with NCI, uh, the National Cancer Institute, um, on the Application Assistance Program. Um, that's our main program that um, caters to women-owned and underrepresented, other underrepresented uh, groups. Um, we also, there's also uh, local programs um, for those in IDEA states. Um, which we can point you to. Um, you can send us an email, um, any, any of your program officers, an email with that question. Great. And um, I was also going to note that um, the institutes at NIH do track and look at um, who is applying. So if you do apply, please do select whether you do have a woman minority owned or if you're, you're from an idea state on your application as well as the uh, Small Business Administration has a variety of resources to help uh, women and minority-owned small businesses. And with that, Alicia, I'll turn it over to you to see if you have anything to add there for ADDF. Well, the last thing that uh, I want to add is, uh, as mentioned before, if you have any questions, if you don't know if your program fits or if you have an idea but 
you are not sure about how to develop it, please get in contact with us because we're happy to talk with you and we're happy to help if we can. Great, thank you. Another question uh, targeted for the NIA uh, funding opportunities. There's a question about a small business, uh, whether they should be using the NIH negotiated indirect rate, um, the minus rate of 10%, or should they budget out of their anticipated FNA not to exceed 40%? So for indirect rates, um, you can request up to 40% uh, without having to um, give justification for that. Thank you. Um, one other question, and if anyone else has questions, please do send them through. But for either program, do the funds have to be repaid back? And are they, um, do they lose any IP control? I'll start off with ADF. So we do, we, we're talking about companies, we do sometimes convertible notes with warrants or equity. And uh, yes, there is something that we, we need to receive back. And again, the goal is to receive capital that we can invest in other research. In terms of IP, we absolutely do not take IP. Thank you. And Dr. Martin, do you want to talk about uh, what the benefits are through NIH? Sure, uh, through NIH, um, the it's a non-dilutive program, so uh, there there is no re repayment that's required, um, and the intellectual property rights are retained by the small business. Thank you. I will pause to see if there, I see a couple other questions coming through. I just wanted to note at the conclusion of this webinar, you'll um, be getting some feedback to uh, fill out. If you would please fill out the link uh, and share with us any particular feedback or things that you'd like to see in the future. We do take that feedback very, very seriously and adjust as well as respond to your needs. Uh, the next question is uh, coming and asking about um, models for demonstrating efficacy of a new therapeutic agent, given that neither mice nor in vitro models are considered representative of the human disease. Dr. Martin, I know you were just touching on that earlier. Do you want to expand at all? Sorry, I didn't see that question. Can you, can re can you repeat that one? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you think, what do you think about animal, about models for demonstrating efficacy of a new therapeutic agent? given that neither mice nor in vitro models are considered representative of the human disease? So that's a great question. It's one of the biggest questions in the field. Um, the, the main goal um, for preclinical is you want to um, demonstrate target engagement. Um, so that, of course, can be in vitro or in vivo. Um, so the model, um, I mean, while it would be ideal if we had an, an animal model that perfectly re recapitulates Alzheimer's disease, we don't. Um, so um, another um, approach that can be taken is, is to find a model that represents the, the therapeutic target that that person is investigating. So they can investigate target engagement of that model. And target engagement, um, to, to move that further, then they need to also show um, biomarker um, uh, with that target engagement using biomarkers so they can translate it into human clinical trials. Next question is, uh, what are the challenge, challenges you are facing in human clinical trials? So I will, I will note, um, and Dr. Martin, perhaps you can share this, but in terms of um, NIA's involvement and whether we do fund clinical trials, maybe that would be a, another way to look at that question. We do have a, um, a, a, a nicely robust clinical trial program. Um, half of our clinical trials are pharmacological with the Alzheimer's, um, in the Alzheimer's area. 
<clears throat> about half of our clinical trials are pharmacological clinical trials um, for Alzheimer's therapeutics. And then the other half is non-pharmacological clinical trials. Um, I don't have the exact number, but, but I can say that um, in looking at our pharmacological clinical trials, um, we target um, many therapeutic uh, target areas, um, not just amyloid or tau, um, but, but um, also synaptic plasticity, uh, vasculature, um, oxidative stress, um, just to name a few. Great, thank you. So can I add something about the previous question about uh, how to translate the study in vitro and animal model? Um, I want to add what we do like in applications when the model is not, let's say the drug target uh, um, vascular aspect in the brain. The ideal animal model is not necessarily a um, transgenic model of Alzheimer's. It has to be a model that is relevant to the to the mechanism study. So it could be just a model of vascular lesion in the brain, for example. And as uh, Zane said, like we really like to see target engagement in these studies. So something that often is missed is a translatable biomarker, meaning that uh, if a st the study is done in animal model, you could do Western blot immunohistochemistry, but then how this is gonna be done in um, human clinical trial. So if you have a uh, CSF plasma biomarker or a PET uh, ligand, that's certainly going to strengthen your proposal. And we do look also in these uh, animal studies, we do look already at the potential to run the clinical trial. So even though it's an animal study, we still want to see how the clinical trial is going to be run. Thank you. Um, there is a question for clarification on ADDF funding and whether the funding is non-dilutive. No, we do, uh, for academics, we do have uh, royalties, but for companies, we do typically convertible notes with uh, insurance, or sometimes we, have, uh, we take equity in the company. Thank you. And then the NIA funding is non-dilutive. Correct. Another, another question relates to confidentiality in terms of how much data is shared. How confidential is the information during the review process, and would it be necessary to first file a prov provisional patent application prior to submission of an application? Dr. Martin, will you take that one first, please? Sure. So the review process is very confidential. The reviewers have to sign a confidentiality agreement before they review. Um, but that said, uh, it, it is um, your ap the application would be um, viewed um, more highly if they did have a patent application uh, prior to the submission um, because it, it shows uh, greater potential for commercialization. But I, I do get that question a lot by um, applicants uh, for proprietary uh, reasons. Um, but to, to ease those fears, um, reviewers cannot um, give any information outside of the study section. I mean, now that said, of course, um, uh, I'm sure that that's um, happened before. So one thing I, I like to advise is if people are very worried about it um, in showing like, for example, um, a structure of their compound um, I advise to give as much information as possible for the reviewer to be able to evaluate um, the feasibility of that compound, such as uh, of, um, um, the, the physico-chemical properties, um, any like PK properties, um, and to show as much of, this, of the structure as possible and then put maybe black boxes over um, any part of that structure that they that they don't want to be seen for proprietary reasons. Thank you. And for us, we do also keep all the information shared with us confidential. All our reviewers are under CDA, and sometimes companies ask to sign a CDA with them, and we're happy to do so. And I agree with Dane, I highly recommend 
to share as much information as possible to make uh, your job uh, easier. Thank you both. The next question relates to whether there is interest in developments of amyloid-related biomarkers or drugs. Um, is NIA or uh, ADDF still funding this area? Okay, uh, so I'll speak first. Um, sorry, <laughs> Alicia. Uh, we do still fund um, amyloid-related um, biomarkers or, or uh, targeted therapeutics, um, but we highly um, encourage um, an increase in novel targets and novel bio biomarker discovery. Um, so uh, for, for amyloid-related um, therapeutics, um, we, we like to call those next-generation amyloid therapeutics because it's not the same as of past um, amyloid therapeutics, such as immunotherapy and other uh, secretase inhibitors, stuff like that. So we do fund um, the next generation amyloid therapeutic um, therapeutics. Um, we do do that. And for the ADDF, we do not fund the drug development or clinical trial on amyloid related we do support uh, biomarker for amyloid. Let's say that there is a novel way to measure uh, amyloid in plasma or in saliva or in the eye. This is something that we're certainly very interested to see. Thank you. I do want to just send a reminder to folks that uh, if you're interested in meeting with uh, NIA staff and you'll be at JP Morgan, um, we did include in the chat some information about how to schedule that one-on-one -on -one in-person meeting. Um, for both ADDF and NIA, you've heard from our leaders that they are open to helping talk to you before you submit an application and uh, discuss your research areas of interest. That is a very important tip uh, in terms of developing a successful application and making sure that um, where you're applying is a good fit and know that there's an investment of time with each application. With that said, I want to thank you for your time. Again, please do uh, respond to some of the feedback questions we're going to be sending you. And I also want to thank our co-hosts, the National Institute on Aging Office of Small Business Research, as well as the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Thank you all for your time, and we hope that you apply for these important programs.